Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Nice to meet you all. Welcome to Joey's AP Pre-Calculus Series. Welcome to topic video 1.1. So the title for lesson 1.1 is Change in Tandem. We're going to cover two lesson objectives, which are first, describe how the input and output values of a function vary together by comparing function values. Number two, construct a graph representing two quantities that vary with respect to each other in contextual scenario. So you should immediately know that what's an input? It's the x values. What's the output? It's the y values. These are some key terms that you have to know. And you should also know how to make a graph, okay, by the given information. So let's cover some key concepts that you must know. We're first gonna learn what a function is. So let's look into the dictionary definition. So a function f from set A to set B is a relation that assigns to each element x in set A exactly one element y in set B. So what this is saying is each element x in set A should match to exactly one element in set B of y. So what this is saying is one x should match to one y. So like if you take a look at this diagram, one x is matched to one y, right? So you call this a function, okay? Then what if one x is not matched to one y? For instance, if there are two arrows, so if one is matched to six and seven, then this is not a function. We call this a relation then, okay? Some students are also confused as if you take a look at eight, there are two corresponding x values, right? But that's not a problem. Although one y has two x, it's still a function. As long as one x is matched to one y, it's a function. We're gonna learn two more important terms. We call set A or the group of x values as the domain. Oftentimes, domain is written as D. What about set B that contains the Y values? It is called D range, okay? So you should know the term domain and range. Domain is the input values, range is the output value. Now, I'm gonna give you a small tip about how to determine whether something is a function or not. It's called the vertical line test. This is the easiest way to determine whether a graph is a function or not. I told you that one X should have one Y, right? The simplest way to determine that is by drawing a random vertical line to a function. If that random vertical line only intersects with one point like this, we call this a function. However, if you look at the right diagram, the random vertical line intersects with two points, right? So this means that one X corresponds to two Y. So this is not a function. This is just a relation, okay? So we can determine whether something is a function or not by doing the vertical line test. Now we're gonna learn about independent variable and dependent variable. This is very important. So uh, first term, let's learn about dependent variable first. So dependent variable, is the variable that changes in response to another variable, okay? And this is called the output value. You see, there are a lot of synonyms, right? Like output, range, y, dependent variable. You should know all these terms. So the dependent variable is the one that is getting changed due to something else, okay? I'm gonna explain that in a bit. So what about the independent variable? The independent variable, determines the value of the dependent variable. We call this the input as well. So the independent variable is the one causing the dependent variable to change, okay? Think it that way. Independent variable is the one making the dependent value so, or the dependent variable to change. I'm gonna explain this more in a minute by solving some problems, okay? Now you're gonna learn a thing called function rule. Let's look into the definition first. A function may be represented using a rule that relates one variable to another. Here, the one variable means x, 
another means y. So a function can be represented with a rule that relates x and y. There are four ways to represent this function rule. We're going to learn all four rules, OK? The first rule is by expressing verbally. So we can just simply explain it in sentence form like this. The output value is two more than the input value. Simple, right? What about the second term? This is called the numerical way of the function rule. So the numerical way is just listing a set of ordered pairs, like 0, 2, 1, 3, 2, 4, 3, 5. This is a numerical way of expressing a function. But if you take a look, these two represent the same thing, right? Because if you look at this numerical way of representation, all output values are two more than the input value, right? Let's learn it the third way as well. We can also express this graphically. The graphical way is literally just drawing the points like this. As you can take a look, always all verbal way, numerical way, graphical way, they represent the same function. It's a different way of just explaining. The fourth way is the analytical way. So the analytical way is just writing the equation. This is also called the algebraic way of the way. So you should be able to do, um, to express a function in all four ways of expressing this function rule. So make sure to memorize it and learn and remind yourself about how to do it. Okay, so verbally, numerically, graphically, and analytically. That's the four ways of expressing the function rule. Okay, now we're gonna learn about the increasing thing, decreasing, and constant. I didn't erase that. But okay, so let's look at the definition. Let f of x, just a quick reminder, f of x is equivalent to y, okay? Let f of x be defined on an interval and let x1 and x2 denote points in that interval. Let's look at a first. A, f is increasing, fill in the blank please, on the interval. f of x1 is greater than f of, sorry, f of x1 is smaller than f of x2 whenever x1 is smaller than x2. So what this is saying is if x2 is greater than x1, then the corresponding y value for x2 should also be greater than the corresponding y value for x1 in order for the graph to be increasing. What this is saying is if you take a, if I like spot two random points, the second dot has a greater x value, right? Then this is saying that if you were to say that this region is increasing, then the corresponding y value for this dot should also be greater than the corresponding y value for the first dot, okay? Let's look at B. F is decreasing on the interval if f of x1 is greater than f of x1 whenever x1 is smaller than x2. So this is the literal opposite of the increasing definition. I'm going to plot two random points again on the decreasing region now. In terms of the x values, the second dot has a greater x value than the first dot, right? But if you take a look at the corresponding y value, the corresponding y value is smaller for the second dot, right? For these situations, we call this the decreasing region, OK? Let's look at C. F is constant on the interval if f of x1 is the same with f of x2 for all x1 and x2. So regardless of what x values are, if the corresponding y value are all equal, it means that it's a straight line, right? Because regardless of where the x is, all corresponding y values are the same. So for situations like C, we call that that's constant. Okay. Now let's solve some examples. Now that we learn all the key concepts, right? Let's look at example one. Determine whether each relation represents y as a function of x. 
Let's look into the scenario. The input value X is a student's ID number. And the output value Y is that student's August 2022 SAT score. So for something to be a function, we have to check if one X is only corresponding to one Y, okay? Take a look. So the X is a student's ID number, right? And an ID number is a unique number, right? So we can make sure that there is only one X value. Let's look into the output value of Y. The Y value is the stat student's August 2022 SAT score. Okay. This is also a unique score, right? That student can only have one August 2022 SAT score as it's impossible to take two August 2022 SAT score, SAT tests, right? Because it's impossible to take the same exam twice, right? So that score is also a unique value. So we can ensure that it's also one Y. So we can say that the answer is Yes. And if you were to write an, an explanation, you can say, as the student's D number, which is a unique value, corresponds to one unique value of August 2022 SAT score, the relation shown above is a function, okay? That's how you can write an answer. Okay, but what if there is no August 2022 here in this question? Then if there is no August 2022 here, and if the dependent variable or if the Y value is just the student's SAT scores, then it's not a function, right? Because the student may be taking multiple SAT tests, so that student can have multiple SAT scores, right? Then for that case, if the student took two SATs and got 15 under for the first test and got 1550 for the second test, it means that for one unique X value, there are two corresponding Y values, right? So if the question didn't specify that it's August 2022, then the answer would be it's not a function, okay? But as they specify, it is a function, okay? That's the right answer for this question. Let's look into example one, part two. Determine whether each relation represents y as a function of x. So this literally gives us like the vertical line test, right? They draw, they have drawn a random vertical line and we can see that there are two intersecting points, right? So immediately we can tell that it's not a function, right? So we can say no. If you were to write explanation, you can say uh, one x value corresponds to two y values as shown with the vertical line test. That would be a valid answer, okay? Okay, let's look into example two. Mr. Schoonard is a renowned botanist. He found out that an additional gram of fertilizer results to a 1.25 centimeter growth of her plant experiment. Refer at the plant's record and describe the independent variable and the dependent variable in the scenario. So our mission is to find, to describe what the independent variable is and what the dependent variable is. Remember my explanation about independent variable and dependent variable? The dependent variable is the value that is getting changed because of the independent variable. So if you take a look at this diagram, we can say that we can see that the plant growth is changing due to the fertilizer, right? So what's the independent variable? 
amount of fertilizer. And what's the dependent variable? Plant growth. Let's look into example three. Use the function rule to express the following relation verbally, graphically, and analytically. I told you that there are four ways to express the function rule, right? Verbal way, graphical way, analytical way, and numerical way. Here, they give the relation in a numerical form, right? So our mission is to also express this numerical way of function rule in verbal way, graphical way, and analytical way, okay? Let's first do the verbal way, because I believe the verbal is the most mm, most easy, the easiest way. So, okay, well, I'm gonna start with the verbal way, okay? So I told you that verbal way uh, writes a sentence, right? So you're gonna write your, your answer as a sentence. We can say that the output value, which is Y, right? The output value is three more than the input value. This is correct, right? Because if you take a look at the numerical form, all output values being three, four, five, six is three more than the input value, right? So that would be the valid answer for the verbal way of expressing the function rule. Let's look into the graphical way. We just have to plot these points. We're gonna draw a Cartesian plane. We're gonna label the y and x axis and the origin. And then let's plot these points. Zero comma three would be da, 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 here. One comma four would be here. 2,5 would be here. And 3,6 would be here. That's it. Let's do the analytical way or the algebraic way now. So let's just write an equation by looking into these order pairs. We have the y intercept, right? So what's the y-intercept? They give you the point 0 comma 3. So the y-intercept is 3, right? And then the output value is 3 more than the input value. So we can just write x here. So the analytical way of the answer would be y equals x plus 3. You can also write it as f of x equals x plus 3. So we've done example three as well. Let's look into example four as well. This is a graph of each function to estimate intervals to the nearest 0.5 units on which the function is increasing, decreasing, or constant. Support the answer numerically. Okay, so let's first estimate by just looking at the graph. So what's the decreasing portion? It's basically from the negative infinity till here, right? So we can write that the decreasing part would be negative infinity to two. We're gonna write this in interval notation. I hope you guys all know about interval notation. This round brackets means that it's not including that point. Okay, what about increasing? It would be this part, right? So two to positive infinity, okay? Why are we not including two? Well, technically, if you take a look at two, it's neither increasing or decreasing. It's more like constant, okay? So that would be the right answer. And the question tells you to support the answer numerically. What this means is they want you to make a table so that this answer that we wrote can match with the table. So if you were to make a table, all you gotta do is, well, shall we try? So they give you this equation, right? So f of t, there's f of t and t, right? 
let's plug in some sample numbers. So zero, one, two, three, four. So if you plug in zero, it's five. If we plug in one, it's negative one. If we plug in two, it's going to be negative three. If we plug in three, it's going to be negative one and then five, right? So by looking at the graph, we can also tell that this region will be decreasing, right? And this region can be increasing. So that's how you can also support your answer numerically, right? Now let's go to LO2. So LO2 was about constructing a graph, right? So I'm going to tell you about some key features for graphing a linear or nonlinear function. Okay, so let's first look at the linear part. So everything is important here, but I've made a blank for things that are very, very, very important. So the first thing is the x-intercept. When you're graphing a linear function, these features will help you to construct a proper graph, right? So basically x-intercept is the point where a graph crosses the x-axis, okay? Y-intercept, y same thing, but it's the y-axis. Um, I talked about increasing, decreasing, so I'm not gonna talk about that right now. A positive and negative mean side, a positive mean side, it's on the portion where its domain, uh, where its domain, it's a portion of its domain where its graph lies above the x-axis, okay? So positive means that the corresponding y value is positive, okay? So we're viewing this in the viewpoint of y, okay? So positive means that f of x is positive from a negative. It means that f of x is negative. This is very important. The last blank is a end behavior. And behavior describes how the function behave as x approaches positive infinity and as x approaches negative infinity. I'm gonna explain this more just in a bit right now. So let's say that there is a function like this, okay? Like if you were to write the end behavior for this function, we can write it as as x approaches negative infinity, y approaches positive infinity, right? Because as x approaches to the negative, y approaches to the positive, right? We have to write two statements, by the way, both positive infinity and negative infinity. So as x approaches positive infinity, y also approaches positive infinity. So this is the sentence format of writing the end behavior. You can also write this in lemon notation. So I'm going to leave it here. And then the same way of this is the limit as x approaches negative, in, negative infinity of f of x would be positive infinity. The limit as x approaches positive infinity of f of x is positive infinity. So basically, this and this are the same thing, and this and this are the same thing. Okay. So we looked into all the features for linear function. We're now going to look into nonlinear function. So continuity means side. Uh, if a function is continuous, it means that it can be graphed with connected lines or connected smooth curves. Uh, in simpler ways, if you can draw a graph without lifting your pen, it means that it's continuous. So if you, you have to not lift your pen, okay? Second term is extrema, okay? Extrema is simply the maximum and minimum values of a function. Uh, let me explain this as well. For max and mean or extrema, there are two types, local and global. Some textbooks explain local as relative and global as uh, absolute, but it's the same word. Local maximum or local minimum means that it's not the, like, like the maximum of the entire function or the minimum of the entire function, but it means that it's a maximum or minimum compared to different values nearby. So let me explain this. So let's say that there's a function like, okay. So here, the global minimum is this point, right? But this, 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 these are also minimum, though we call 
these the local minimums and this as the global minimum. Same thing is applicable for maximum, okay? So we learned about extrema. Last plank would be symmetry. Symmetry means that it's basically the mirror. So there's a line symmetry and point symmetry, but we're not gonna deal that with that detail because it's not important. Now we're gonna learn about rate of change. Rate of change is basically change in y over change in x. We also call this as the slope. If the slope is positive, then if we think it's the shape would be like this, right? And if the slope or the rate of change is negative, then the shape will be like this, right? Based on this, we can say that a graph is concave up if the rate of change is increasing or positive, and it's concave down when the rate of change is negative or decreasing. So if you take a look for this part, concave up, the rate of change is increasing. It's a positive value. But for this region, for concave down, it's a negative word because it's decreased. Okay. Now we're going to learn about some synonyms. We learned about x intercepts, right? But there are uh, different synonyms for this. We also call x intercept as roots, zeros, and solutions. It's just the same thing. But solutions are more used with equations. So our roots and these two are more used for graphs, okay? But it's basically the same thing, okay? Now you're gonna solve some examples. Graph the following, oh wait, sorry. Graph the following function by filling out a table. Y equals two X plus one. We have the input value and the output value. So the output value for three would be two times three plus one, so it's, Six plus one, seven. Two times four plus one, eight plus one, nine. Two times five plus one, 10 plus one, 11. So we know what output values are based on input values, right? That's one of our learning objectives is that uh, it's important that you know the graph of a function displays a set of input output pairs and shows how the values of the functions input and output values vary, okay? It's very important that you notice, okay? So let's just graph it now. Draw the Cartesian plane. One comma three, two comma five, three comma seven, four comma. 9, then 11. So it would be a just straight line. Ta da! Perfect, right? Let's look into example two. Use the graph in G to find a domain in the range of the following function. Okay, so for the domain, we can say that uh, the function starts from here, right? And then it goes till positive infinity, right? But if you take a look, there's a discontinuity, point discontinuity. At x equals two, right? So we're gonna exclude that two point. I'm gonna teach you how to do that in interval notation. So there is a hole here as well. So we're gonna write round brackets, negative four to two round brackets. And to exclude two, we're going to write the union, which means or two to positive infinity. Easy, right? For the range, it's the y value. So it would be so the range for the top function would be six, right? Plus six. And Excluding negative two, 
sorry, negative infinity two, excluding negative two. That would be the correct domain and range, okay? Use the given key features to sketch a linear graph. The y-intercept is negative 70. The function is positive for x is smaller than negative 30. The function is decreasing for all values of x. As x equals positive infinity, f of x equals, sorry, f of x approaches negative infinity. And x, as x approaches negative infinity, f of x approaches positive infinity, sorry. It's a linear graph. And by looking into the, the end behavior, we can uh, immediately know what the shape is, right? As it approaches positive infinity for x, it approaches negative infinity, right? So we can say that the it looks kind of like this, right? The overall shape, okay? And then let's reflect some key features that they give us. Okay, let's draw a proper Cartesian plane here. And they gave us the y-intercept, right? So we have to make a, the graph to pass here. And the function is positive for x is smaller than negative 30. So if the function is less than negative 30, say that negative 30 is here, we have to make that function to stay in the top part, right? So we can say that this is the x-intercept. So by just connecting these two points, we can sketch a graph. Ta-da, that would be the right answer. Let's now do the same thing for nonlinear function. This is harder, so buckle up. Uh, yeah, let's again draw, let's first look into the end behavior first. So as x approaches positive infinity, f of x approaches positive infinity, and x, as x approaches negative infinity, f of x approaches positive infinity. So we can say that the overall shape is something like this. Okay, having that in mind, let's draw a Cartesian plane x-axis, y-axis, origin. So they give you the y-intercept as five, right? So we have to make this thing to pass negative five, right? And they tell us that it's continuous, so we shouldn't lift our pin up. The function is positive for x is smaller than negative three and x is greater than four. They gave us the two x-intercepts, right? Why? Because uh, it's telling us that if it's this part or if it's this part, it should stay in the top part, meaning that those are the x-intercepts, okay? So the part about positive or negative is the feature that tells you the x-intercept, okay? The function is a minimum at two comma negative six. So where is two comma negative six? Let's spot it. Two, three, four, five. Here, right? So I plotted regions where it, the graph must pass. So as also, it's, it doesn't mention whether it's a global or a local minimum. It's generally then it's global minimum, okay? So this point should be the lowest point. All we gotta do is just connect the points now. Yeah, this would be the right answer. Um, as long as you meet all the key features, your answers can differ slightly. So for instance, I just like drawing flat lines, right? But you can still do it like, like this, like anything is the answer, as long as it meets these 